Thessalonians, please. Second Thessalonians. Thank God for amazing grace. Amazing grace. I can I can pretty much say with confidence we're going to get out of chapter two anyway <laughs> tonight. Ah, chapter two. Second Thessalonians chapter number two. Second Thessalonians chapter number two. We've looked at the relation of the day of the Lord to the present, verse number one and two. The relation of the day of the Lord to apostasy, that's erring from the truth, that's verse number three. Actually, a large turning away, and they're turning away. You can see it. Um, isn't it something how that uh, I need to comment on that program today, uh, that call in program? I don't believe it's been that stirred up. So that tells you, I guess, what we need to talk about. But people have tried to silence churches on talking about different situations in the world, especially politics. Maybe we need to speak out more so we can get more response. Well, they, they, they've tried to, they, you know, the government's tried to put fear in our lives and us. They're going to take away our 501c3. Well, for Pete's sake, pay, pay taxes. If they want to take it away, pay taxes. You know, why, why, would, why, would a, why would a church or, or a man, why would they, a pastor or a leader, why would they compromise truth for the sake of a few dollars? Amen. Um, I don't understand that, but they're doing it, you know. So, Trump on down to the poll, amen. And, sir? Yeah. And it'll, it'll, yeah, Brother Dana knows he's a tax man, but that's, it's, money, money's, uh, money seems to be the governing factor of why we don't speak up sometimes. And, uh, we need to speak up for what's right. We don't, we don't, and you need to go to the polls and vote. Vote, vote. Um, how did I get that out of Second Thessalonians? Oh, I know how I got it in relation to the day of the Lord to apostasy. Fits right in. It does fit right in, so I'm not stretching it, really. Um, apostasy, the world is, uh, the natural mind receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So the world's naturally going to go the wrong direction. So the light of the world, the light, the light of the world is the church, we're the salt of the earth, and we're the light of the world, the Holy Spirit in us, so we need to carry that light. We don't need to put it under a bushel. So carry the light. Tell, I mean, tell people what you think. Tell people, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad that show came on. And if you didn't hear that show, Brother Dewey got a sound chewing out, but he didn't back down. <laughs> so I told him I was going to rib him a little bit, you know. But uh, no, he didn't back down. He stayed with the stuff. and um, The truth came out. Truth came out. What was it, what was it that fellow wrote in, Brother Dewey? Uh, Cotton, was it Cotton that wrote in and said, abortion... Is legal, but if uh, if you kill a woman with child, it's a double homicide if you kill a woman with child. But if you kill a baby in a woman, there's nothing. You know what? That's the devil. That's the devil. He he. The devil can't even agree with himself. You ever thought about that? He can't agree. Let me give you a story. Uh, Tim Lee, y'all know Evangelist Tim Lee, whether you like him or not, that doesn't, it's irrelevant. But he was at a, at a county fair, and there was three groups of people. One, one group of people were, was child advocates. And that really, you know, that really hit the, hit the, hit, hit the country here, what, in the 90s? Children suing their parents, and parents can't discipline your children, and all that kind of stuff. So he was, a, there was a child advocate, right? And then there was a uh, woman's right group for abortion. Uh, you know how they set up booths in the fair? And then this other booth right down the, right down the place there was uh, uh, for gay rights, for homosexual rights. He said, I don't usually... You ever, he said this, and I, I put myself in his shoes. He said, I don't usually think of what I need to say till after I get home. Don't you wish that we could just recall everything we needed right then? Well, the Lord will help. He said, but I thought of it there. He said, hold a minute. 
He said, you're all together. He said, yes, we are, they said. He said, well, I thought I'd like to hang them all together, but he, he didn't say that. But he, that's, what he, that's what he said to the congregation. But he said, you got, you got one that's four babies. Am I right? I mean, you're, you're for, for children. That, yes, that's what we are. Yes, sir. Then you got this crowd over here killing them. And you got this crowd over here can't even have them. You see, the, the devil is a confused individual. And he wants to confuse. Well, you say he's got an agenda. I know he's not confused. He's got an agenda. But um, he contradicts himself all the time. So if we would stay true to the stuff there, you know, and, and um, apostasy is coming in. This is relation. Chapter 2 is a relation of the day of the Lord to apostasy. Yes, sir. Well educated, forever learning, Mrs. King said today on the radio, forever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what it is. All right, so the relation of the day of the Lord to present, the relation to the day of the Lord to apostasy, the relation of the day of the Lord to the man of sin, that's the Antichrist, according to chapter number 2, verse 3, 4, and 5, and also 8, 9, and 10. The relation of the day of the Lord to the restrainer. Verse 6 and 7. You know that's the Holy Spirit. The Antichrist is. The man of sin is the Antichrist. Energized by Satan. The restrainer. Only he who now letteth will let. Till he be taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked be revealed. Whom the Lord will consume. Uh, with the. Uh, what is it. With the, with the word of his mouth. The brightness of his coming. Let me read it. Spirit of his mouth. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Verse number 8. So. We have. We have the Bible tells us specifically what is stopping the Antichrist from being revealed. And what is that? Or who is he, should I say? The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit resides where? In the belief. We're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So why don't we act like it? Why don't we act like it? So that's it, it all. And 2 Thessalonians had come in a timely, timely situation, didn't it, really? during this election and so forth. and So we have the relation of the day of the Lord to the restrainer, re relation of the day of the Lord to the unbeliever. In verse 10, 11, and 12, um, and they were not lost in going to hell because they took the mark of the beast. You, I, I can't stress that enough. Verse 10 said they were lost and on their way to hell is because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Anyone that believes on Christ can get saved, can be born again, go to heaven. Anyone. So, so that's not why they're lost, is because they took the mark. They took the mark because they were lost. You see that. So they didn't believe. All right, then the relation of the day of the Lord to the believer. In verse number 13 through verse number 17. Verse number 13. The Bible said, But we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace... Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and every good word and work. So we see the relation of the day of the Lord to the believer. The believer's position is given there in verse number 13 and 14. There's two things about the believer's position. I believe we mentioned this last week. First of all, he's been chosen. Verse number 13, look at it. Uh, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Who's chosen? I am. Who's chosen? You are. Who else is chosen? Huh? Ever, speak up. It's, it's no, not a secret. Go ahead. Everyone, the whole world's chosen to believe. Am I right on that? Am I right? Everybody got that? Am, am I right? Everyone is chosen to believe. Um, the whole world. In other words, um, we do believe in divine sovereignty, but we also believe in human responsibility. What's the human responsibility? 
uh, the Bible said in verse 14, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. How did God choose you according to the latter part of verse number 13? How did, how did you get in? Through sanctification of the Spirit, set apart of the Spirit, and what belief of the truth. So we have divine sovereignty and then we have human responsibility. Now, let me read a verse to you to, to just prove what I said in 2 Peter chapter 2. I like this verse. I've used it, used it everywhere I go, used it in a lot of sermons. Second, and, and it's to present a truth. The Bible is truth, but it's to present this, to drive this truth home that everyone has been bought with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that does not mean that everyone's going to heaven. You're going to heaven when you believe the truth, according to verse 13 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. All right, look at verse, uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were many, there, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privilege shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord. And what did the Lord do for them? He bought them. He bought them. When did he buy them? At Calvary. How did he buy them? With his blood. Amen. Jesus Christ shed his blood for the remission of sins. That's to everyone. Turn over to, turn over to um, 1 John chapter, chapter 2. 1 John, just a few pages over to 1 John chapter 2. My little children, these things write I unto you. Verse 1. That you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he, that is Jesus Christ, is the propitiation. Propitiation means that Jesus Christ satisfied the demands of a holy God. He's a satisfactory sacrifice. Jesus is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for who? For the whole world. So the whole world has had their sins paid for on Calvary. Yes, sir. <laughs> Amen. Is, not can be. Is. He is a propitiation. Look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. These are just verses that you need that you don't get every day. A lot of preachers don't touch them. A lot of, and, and, and believe me, um, I went around the circuits of Baptists before I ever got saved. Yeah. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, are you there? Underline it. For therefore we both labor, 1 Timothy 4, 10. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because... We trust in the living God. Um, I don't think God made a mistake here to you. What's the next phrase? The Savior of all men. All right, if anyone wanted to argue that, they could say, yeah, he's just talking to the saved. Well, why does the Holy Spirit add the rest of that to that verse? Especially, or especially of those that believe. He's the Savior of all men. What does a Savior do? Say, he shed his blood, he bought the whole world, the whole world has been chosen. Back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, just because the whole world has been chosen does not mean the whole world's going to heaven. Because if you go to um, Revelation chapter number 20, there's going to be a multitude stand before the great white throne judgment and are going to be cast into the lake of fire. Did you know that everyone that stands before the great white throne judgment had an opportunity to accept Christ as their Savior? Every, every, every last one, every person, every, everyone. You have an opportunity. The Bible said um, in verse number 13, We are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. I can get in the family... When I believe what Jesus Christ has done satisfied the demands of God. God's law says guilty. God's law says do. Jesus Christ says I'll do it and did it. He paid our sin debt. The wages that the law required, Jesus paid that sin debt. 
God became a man, went to Calvary as a perfect sacrifice. He did not have any human blood as far as sinful blood. And by the, by the way, everyone, everyone that's born of man is what? He's a sinner. There is, wherefore is by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men. all men for that all have sinned. You'll find that in Romans 5, 12. So in order to be the sacrifice that would be acceptable to God, the sacrifice had to be sinless. There's no one sinless but Jesus Christ. He's God. He's God in the flesh. Therefore, he satisfied God. Now, when you believe that truth, then we're placed by the Holy Spirit of God, we're placed into the family and the body of Christ, in the family of God. We're a family. We're a family. And um, he seals us until that day of bodily redemption. Amen. And he imputes to you his righteousness, which is himself. Jesus Christ is righteous. He's the righteousness of God. All right. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of, the, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. We've been chosen. Verse number 13. We've been called. Now, again, both divine and human responsibility concerning salvation of the soul. On God's part, everything is included. Everything is done in Christ, even to the point of giving you everything you need to even believe Him. Now, that's a wonderful God. I don't have to, there's no guesswork involved here. There's no beating your brains out to wonder where it's at. It's right in front of you. You have, did you know that God said in this book, he said, and God doesn't lie, this is your standard. That was the whole point of the conversation that that lady was having with Brother Dewey. Brother Dewey's trying to get her to realize her standard is this. Quit making up your own standards, dear lady, and believe the standard of the Word of God. Abortion is murder. Abortion's a sin. It's not your privilege. Well, it is your privilege as a lost person. You can do what you want to do. You can go against God. God's not going to force you to accept his law. But that's a whole other story. That's a whole other story. But right here, uh, we're finding that uh, on God's part, everything is done even to the point of giving you light. John chapter number 1, verse 9, he has lighted every man that comes into the world. So we have light. We have a measure of light. We act upon that light. God gives us more light. We have a conscience. We have the word of God. All right. Now, your part, what's your part? To respond by faith. You know what faith is? Believing God. Faith is an active response to the truth of God. I know it to be true. Why? Because God said it. God said it. Not just I, do I know what the Bible says, but I believe what the Bible says. Amen. I believe it. While the choosing of verse number 13 is in eternity, the calling of verse number 14, and write it down, it's related to time. There was a moment in time that you received that truth and were born in God's family. It was accomplished. How was it accomplished? Through our gospel, through the preaching of the gospel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Romans 1, 16 and 17. So we preach the gospel. If we're preaching the gospel, let's include the gospel. The gospel is Jesus Christ. And Christ has paid the debt. And, of course, it was accomplished through preaching the gospel. That's what the Bible said through our gospel there in um, 2 Thessalonians. I've already moved my place there. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse number 13 and verse number 14. All right, the believer's practice, verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by epistle. Therefore, therefore, since believers are going to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. How did I find that out? Verse 14. Since I'm going to obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is, and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ is bodily redemption. Yeah. yeah. Since I'm going to obtain that glory, and how do I know that I'm going to get a new body? Turn, well, hold your place. I'll just, I'm glad you asked me. I'll show you. Uh, Romans 8. Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. Uh, verse 21, I like verse 22, let me put that in there. All of it's good, but for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, by reason of him who is subjected to same in hope. 
And we talked about that men's prayer meeting, I believe it was, a Bible study. Because the creature itself, that's why the world is deteriorating on a collision course with destruction. The creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. God, because, listen, Adam brought sin in the world. Men are dying physically. The world is groaning, creaking and cracking, volcanoes, earthquakes. And God has subject this world and creation and creatures to, uh, to, to destruction. And he subjected those that are subject to destruction. He subjected the same in hope. Aren't you glad that we have something at the end of the tunnel? We have light at the end of the tunnel. We got a new body coming. We got a new world coming, a new earth, new heaven coming. All right, now the Bible said in verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit. And what is the adoption to wit? The redemption of the body. See, God, 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 I'm saved and sealed and sitting together in heavenly places, Ephesians chapter number 2. But I already know. It's etched in stone. It's not, I don't have to wonder. I already know that I'm going to get a body like his, 1 John 3, 2. 1 John chapter 3, and verse 2, I'm going to get a body like him. And I'm not ever going to ache and complain and moan and groan and gossip and carry on anymore. Hallelujah, Lord. <laughs> it's all going to be great. That's the redemption of the body. I'm going to have a brand new body. The outside is going to match the inside. All right, now, that's 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. We don't know, um, as he appears, we don't know how, what he, how he is. How we know what he is and who he is. Uh, how does that verse go? Come, when he shall come, we shall be like him. There you go. All right, thank you, brother. We shall be, you'll see that, write it down, 1 John 3, 2. All right, what about Ephesians chapter 1? We always quote, um, verse number 13 and that's a very good verse underline that verse but look at verse 14 look at verse 14 um, when we believed according to verse number 13 we were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise verse 14 he which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory I have within me and you do if you're saved you have within you the very, the very Spirit of God, who is God. The Spirit of God is the third person of the Trinity. You have Him in you, and He is your earnest until the redemption of, who, of the purchased possession. I'm purchased. I'm His. 1 Corinthians 6. And He's going to give me a new body. I'm going to give you one too. And that's what the Bible's talking about in 2 Thessalonians, verse number 14, uh, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, I need to stand fast and hold fast. Hold fast what? The tradition, traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Not, not just mere traditions of man. Uh, we're to stand fast according to verse number 15. And standing fast, we're not overcome by Satan. Therefore, we stand fast in the midst of opposition from the enemies of Christ and these times of uncertainty. And my dear friend, we are in times of uncertainty. We don't, know what, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, well, we never know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I'm talking about with, the, with the, the, everything going like it is, with this apostasy worldwide running rampant, getting stronger and stronger. Whoever, 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 whoever dominates the, the executive office and uh, the legislative office, uh, Judicial and the judicial. Well, what it is, the executive office is going to appoint some judges. They're up for how many is up for three, 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 three judges, and judges don't go on two and four year terms. They're life. So if a liberal, if a liberal God hating individual gets in office, they're going to appoint some judges after their own character. And that means that for 40 years, this, 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 if the Lord doesn't come back, this is, we're going to be even more oppressed. And you better look at your grandbabies 
If you're my age, you better look at your grandbabies when you go to the poll and vote. This is probably one of the most crucial, most crucial elections you'll ever be involved in in your life. Yes, it has. But people aren't waking up. People aren't waking up. And I guess we've said more and been more outspoken here at the Faith Baptist Church because I think that leadership is realizing just how important it is. And if everything does fall and arise and fall on leadership, then leadership needs to be taking a stand as well. Yeah, you, you believe that? Yes, sir. And a cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> That's a flat screen. I guess it is. All right. All right. Anyway, we stand fast and we hold the tradition. Now, this is not when it talks about hold the tradition. It's not something made up by man, but what has been passed down from God to man. Second Thessalonians chapter three and verse number six. Now, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. So you see there's good traditions. There's bad traditions, Matthew 15. Men are, men are placing their bad traditions over the commandments of God and they're letting their traditions supersede the word of God. But here you see the context Hold fast to the traditions that are right. They're right. There's some good traditions, you know that? There's real good traditions. There's some good, and we need to, we need to pass, and what is that good tradition? The Word of God. The Word of God. Um, now, not only we looked at um, 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, but uh, just write these down. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 13 and following, and also 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 2, the Bible said in 2 Timothy 2, 2, And the things which I hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. You know what that is? Commit to faithful men, handing down the traditions. We're committing to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's what we do at Faith Bible College. That's what we do in the services on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. But we do it at Faith Bible College. We... we, we Teach men and commit to men and women that they can commit to others. You see, if God will just put one person in your life that you could commit to, although we need to commit to more, but if God would, if that one person that God's put in your life, whether it be your children, your wife or your husband, whoever it is, you commit to that one, did you know that your more is going to be reached? If you'll just, if you'll just pour your life into people, pour your life into people. Brother Dewey, didn't, Brother Dewey didn't hate that girl that called. I didn't hate that lady that called. I didn't hate the fellow that cussed me out there. You know when I got cussed out there in my front yard? I was thinking about Shimei. You know what David told his men? He said, maybe I needed a good cussing. Maybe God knew I needed a good cussing. <laughs> you know what? It just, it, what it'll do is just keep you going on. I don't, I don't hate that individual. I want that individual to get saved. I, 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 and you want that individual to get saved. We're not... Yeah, and the world's going to act like the world. Do you expect them to act any differently? You know, you know what I've found? You know, let me tell you a profound lesson I've learned in 40 years of ministry, 35 plus years of ministry. Profound lesson I've learned. Sinners are supposed to sin. Settles it. So what do we do? We just keep preaching to them. Yes, sir. And they think you're right in their own eyes. In their own eyes. They do. I mean, they, they do. And now back up, back up a little bit in your life. Back up a little bit in your life before you got saved. You were as honored as they was. Some of you was, anyhow. Yes. <laughs> Amen. All right. Yeah, but so we just keep preaching the gospel. That's not going to stop us from preaching. It's, it's not. Uh, Paul, it does. Paul was in prison, had somebody chained to him. He kept preaching anyway. Yeah, he just kept preaching to the guards. Committing to others that could commit to others. So that's what we need to do. 
Um, so hold the traditions. Uh, thank God for the Word of God. Uh, chapter 2 closes with prayer for strength to stand fast and hold fast. Chapter number 2, verse number 16, invokes the help of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father who loved us. And of course, that was proven at Calvary, wasn't it? That was proven at Calvary, no question about it. And he's given us everlasting consolation. You know what that is? That's solace and comfort. Solace and comfort. He's done that already. And good hope through grace. A good expectation. How did it happen? Through God's unmerited favor. Therefore, you cannot lose. You just can't lose with all of it going for you. Amen? So we go on because of Christ. Here's your summary of chapter 2, and we're out of chapter 2 going to chapter 3 next week. Chap chapter 2. Here's a summary. Simply this. Do not be disturbed, for the day of the Lord has not yet come. When it does come, it will be a terrible time of revealing the limited power of Satan through the Antichrist, the man of sin. But you believers, I'm just summarizing chapter 2, but you believers will not experience these awful things for your prospect is glory, not wrath. Glory, not wrath. In the meantime, in the meantime, however, maintain a strong and stable Christian testimony in every good word and work. That's a good summary. Why not just say that in the start? <laughs> Amen. 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 Let's stand to our feet. We're going to have a... I'm going to open the doors of the church for a reason. I want to... We're going to, we're going to do that right now. And if anybody else needs to come and pray, we'll let you come too. We'll, you'll come. You feel like you just need to come as we stand to our feet, come and pray and ask God for some help. Maybe do pray for revival, pray for your family.